As we all know, war doesn't discriminate when it comes to its victims. During World War I, 10 million people were killed from all classes and many countries. Among the dead were 42 members of the English House of Commons MPs. On the 4th of November 1914, Arthur O'Neill was the very first MP to be killed, as Mark Duncan from Century Ireland now tells us. Privileged or poor, public personality or private individual, it really didn't matter. The First World War was democratic in its delivery of death. On November the 4th, 1914, three months to the day after Britain had declared war on Germany, the indiscriminate horror of what had been unleashed in Europe was reinforced by news that had claimed the life of its first MP. Arthur O'Neill, who had represented the mid-Antrim constituency since 1910 and who served as captain with the Second Lifeguards, was killed fighting in Belgium in circumstances that press reports of the time did little to illuminate. O'Neill was an Irish Unionist cut from aristocratic cloth. His biography everywhere emphasised status and privilege. The eldest son and heir of Baron O'Neill, once a Conservative MP for County Antrim, he had been educated at Eton and had married the daughter of the Marquis of Crewe, with whom he lived in the splendour of Shane's Castle on the shores of Loch Ney. It was this background that shaped O'Neill's political outlook, in particular his opposition to the nationalist efforts to secure home rule for Ireland. In September 1912, he had joined with a quarter of a million Protestant Ulstermen in signing a covenant pledging resistance to a measure that, they believed, threatened the civil and religious freedoms and the very integrity of the British Empire. But O'Neill offered more than a signature to the anti-home rule cause. Decorated for military service in South Africa in the late 1890s, he also lent his experience to the Ulster Volunteer Force, commanding the North Antrim Regiment of a movement whose militancy only abated when war in Europe intervened. Arthur O'Neill's involvement in that war lasted only three weeks and his death, aged 38, robbed a wife of her husband and five children of their father. The youngest of those children, a boy, was only two months old in November 1914. His name was Terence and on growing up he would follow the father he never knew into the political life. In time, Terence O'Neill would become the Prime Minister of Northern Ireland, a state that had hardly been imagined, let alone realised at the moment of his father's death. Mark Duncan there on Arthur O'Neill, who was the first MP to die in World War I a century ago this week. And I'm joined now by Conor Mulva of uh, UCD. Um, Do we have any idea, are there any diaries, are there any recollections from Terence O'Neill about the effect of growing up entirely without a father? There's there's nothing that I've read about Terence's actual own recollections of his or lack of recollections of his father I, I, I suppose but instead what we have here is a deep psychological effect and we can see in Terence O'Neill's own pre-prime ministerial career some of the emulations of his father's life he, he never knew his father he was less than two months old when his father died but he became a captain himself um, just like his father and he fought in the second world war um, and, and had trained at Sandhurst um, prior, prior to taking that commission. So Terence O'Neill was definitely someone who saw that role of um, service within the British military as being part of active citizenship. And that was something um, that I think we, we can read back onto his father and his service. Now we're going to talk about the Irish MPs who died, the Irish MPs who served, or in the case of one, somebody who had been an MP. The two Irish fatalities uh, uh, of the of the, of that number are probably the best known. Would be Tom Kettle, who was no longer an MP and but had been, and uh, William Redmond, John Redmond's brother. To what extent was pressure put on the likes of Kettle and the likes of Redmond by their recruiting activities to go on active service? So the Irish Parliamentary Party and and constitutional nationalists um, become deeply part of the recruiting machine within Ireland um, as soon as the war breaks out. And actually before the war breaks out, in the case of John Redmond, who the night before the declaration of war is the one that actually says well, the volunteers will become part of the British war effort, not necessarily on foreign fields. Um, so there is, there is very much pressure on MPs to become part of the recruiting uh, machine. Famously, Joseph Devlin um, becomes a, a recruiting sergeant if we want to put that slightly pejorative moniker on him. Um, but they become deeply involved in the recruiting in question and Tom Kettle as an ex-MP he decided not to actually contest the December 1910 election um, having previously sat for North Tyrone um, in one of those swing swing seats and one of those pivotal national seats on the border Um, he then decides that because of Sinn Féin pressure, because of um, his own rhetoric that he's espousing on the war, that he should serve. And 
I would argue that he's not an ideal candidate to become a British officer. Kettle has struggled with a drink problem for a very long time and even after having studied um, to become a, an officer, he doesn't go and serve on the front for a very long time um, because of his continuing problems with drink and his continuing um, depression and melancholia that he's suffering at this time. Now, also his service had less to do with Irish nationalism than perhaps uh, William Redmond's did because of where he was in 1914. Yeah, well, Tom Kettle, and we've discussed this uh, previously in this forum, and I, I've discussed it elsewhere, um, was unusual in that at the outbreak of the war, he was in Belgium, but he was there buying weapons from the Belgian government to bring to Ireland. So he he does have a, a multifaceted role at the start of the war, but one of the things, apart from purchasing weapons, which the Belgian government were actually looking to, to requisition for their own uses, and they, they had very pressing need for weapons uh, in August of 1914, as one can imagine. Um, he did see atrocities that Germans were per- per- perpetuating and, and carrying out at first hand. So he had much more first hand experience of atrocities in Belgium than, let's say, John Redmond at home. So therefore, it was less to do with the creation of an Irish nation forged in battle, as John Redmond envisaged, and more to do with um, anti-German excesses. However, I must stress on this that Tom Kett himself was not a Germanophobe um, by any sense or a Francophile as was the other famous MP who served in the First World War, Stephen Gwynne who was very much a Francophile. Tom Kettle um, as a professor of economics had read a lot of those famous German economists of the 19th century particularly Liszt I'm thinking of here and therefore he wasn't culturally um, against this this idea of of a Prussian um, Junker uh, militarist nation as some other MPs were in Ireland. He left something of immediate artistic value behind uh, a couple of days before his death, didn't he? To my daughter, Betty. Mm. Kettle is obviously a poet as well and as an economist and a soldier and a politician and he's a man of many hats. And a barrister. And a barrister. His poetry was was well respected throughout his life and he was also known as an essayist but his, his final poem is, is arguably his most famous today. I imagine that legions of, of school students both at junior and, and leaving cert level will know very well that we died Not for, for flag nor king nor emperor but for a dream born in a herdsman's shed and for the exactly. secret scripture of the poor and, and famously resurrected as you said there in the last line a secret scripture of the poor in Sebastian Barry so mm. it becomes iconic of the First World War that poem it also I think points to the enduring question and you've engaged in this debate yourself of why did Irishmen serve in the First World War and Kettle proposes a counter narrative to that and says it's not economic necessity it's not nationalism and you know he very clearly states in his his dying epitaph to his daughter that he dies for a sense of spiritualism and this is something that that I think loses its resonance in in later years and this same thing is said by Grace Gifford of of Joseph Mary Plunkett that he died for a spiritualist semi-catholic semi semi-christian ideal and that's something that's difficult for us to understand I think um, 100 years after the fact whereas economic necessity or nationalism are much easier to reconcile in 2014 Okay Redmond will you Redmond could easily have survived the war. He should never have really been on the front line in uh, on the 7th of June 1917. The brother of the uh, future Prime Minister of Ireland as it was seen at the time, a 56 year old major in the British Army who goes over um, a ridge after a, a number of mines have just exploded, suffers from very severe shock after a minor injury from, uh, from a shell and, and from these mines and dies where he fell. Uh, famously taken back from the, the firing line by members of the 36th Ulster Division underlining exactly what John Redmond was looking for that coming together of orange and green in the trenches so William Redmond is important in terms of John Redmond's justification for going to war but William Redmond was certainly one of the the older casualties even among parliamentarians um, at the front and if we think back to the the person we started today with Arthur O'Neill was 38 William Redmond decades his senior Mm -hmm. so so yes he shouldn't have been at the front really if, if we want to put it that way but he was someone who believed quite profoundly in the whole notion of going to war of martial service and that was something that was strong in the Redmond family and I would argue in the South Leinster gentry generally. Redmond not only saw his brother go off to war but also his son William Archer Redmond who took over the seat after Redmond's own death not war related in March of 1918. Uh, Redmond was also a passionate advocate of cooperation between
between the 16th uh, Division, Irish Division, the Nationalist Division and the 36th Ulster uh, Division and hoped that that would have a, a healing effect. Absolutely. Many statesmen see in the First World War an opportunity to create new nations. The Australians create a new nation where all the divisions um, that had pre-existed in Australian society, the colonial stain, or sorry, the convict stain, had all been expunged through military service. And Redmond does the exact same thing on Europe's uh, western periphery by trying to create this orange and green in the trenches. And, and that's fundamental for him and his, his role. Now, you mentioned the, the Redmond family and um, William Archer Redmond also fought in World War One, although he survived. Another family, which a uh, political family, Irish political family, which was a, still a very prominent political family up to about uh, 20 or 30 years ago, uh, made also huge sacrifices. The Esmond family. Tell me about their involvement. These are a very interesting family. And I, I suppose one of the early experiences I had of the Esmond family was going to try and find any political content in a, a file marked Esmond Papers in the National Library. And that was actually recollections of a previous Esmond in the, um, in the Boer War. So they're very much a martial family. To list off the four Esmond casualties in the First World War, John J. Um, Esmond is the first casualty as a sitting MP who dies in 1915. Then his son, who actually who doesn't die, so there's, there's actually three casualties, uh, Lieutenant John Limbrick Esmond, then takes the seat of his father while a serving lieutenant. So he's, he's absent from Parliament because of his war service. But after John J. Esmond has died, his son takes his seat. His elder son actually dies. Geoffrey Esmond um, dies in October of 1916. And just previous to that, the son of Thomas Henry Grattan Esmond, who's another one of the Esmonds, he dies at the Battle of Jutland earlier in 1916. So we can see four serving members of the family and three of them die. So a really monumental effect on that family by the war. And, and again, that's really linked back to the South, uh, South Leinster gentry, that this was part of their um, sense of, of, I suppose, civic um, action was to actually serve within the military. Uh, barely a week after the death of Tom Kettle at, uh, at Ginchy in September 1916, in, in the same area, there was another significant political death or at least a political by association and that was the death not of an Irish MP but of Raymond Asquith the son of Henry Herbert Asquith the Prime Minister Absolutely and this is, the whole idea of sons going to fight I think is, is one of the most moving if, if that word is appropriate aspects of this not only Redmond's son but also Asquith's son goes to serve uh, D.D. Sheehan's son goes to serve many MPs decide that the war is of sufficient value and they might be old uh, old enough themselves that it's actually worth risking their own sons' lives and obviously sons across Britain, Ireland and, and, and across Europe went and fought in the war um, this wasn't an unfamiliar narrative but for MPs to, to really put their words where their mouth were and, and send sons off to fight in the war is something that um you know, is is quite profound in this day and age to think about, mm. and and obviously the the psychological effect this has on Asquith is really he never damaging. Got over it. He no, never it's, recovered. it's it's one of those big losses that has a tremendous political and personal effect on him throughout the rest of his life, really. And of course, he loses his job, as it were, at the end of 1916. It uh, certainly must have contributed in some way to his political downfall, yeah. psychologically at least. Connor, thank you very much indeed, uh, Connor Mulva on Irish MPs during the First World War.